Welcome students to another exciting installment in our discussion on chemical equilibrium. Before beginning this lecture in my typical format, I'd like to start by sharing with you a hilarious chemistry cat from quickmeme.com. This one says, atoms are happy when their orbitals are half full, unless they're pessimists. <laughs> All right, well after this set of lectures videos that will ensue, you guys should be able to do the following. First, calculate Kp from reaction components individual pressures. Second, calculate Kc from reaction components individual pressures by using the ideal gas law. Third, calculate Kc from initial and equilibrium reaction concentrations. Fourth, calculate Qc and Qp and use them to predict the direction the reaction will shift to reach equilibrium. And fifth, explain Le Chatelier's principle and predict the direction a reaction will shift to reach equilibrium when each of the following disturbances are made. First, change in volume or pressure. Second, change in temperature. And third, by adding a catalyst. That's the lineup. Let's get started returning to Kp. In an earlier lecture, we discussed rate constants. We learned that for any equilibrium reaction such as this one, the rate constant Kc is equal to this. As it turns out, we can also calculate rate constants in terms of pressure called Kp, which we also mentioned in an earlier lecture. Thus, for any reaction like this one, in which each of the components are gases, and they have to be gases, the rate constant in terms of pressure, Kp, is equal to this, where P, C, D, A, and B are the individual pressures of gases C, D, A, and B, respectively. Woo! So let's take a look at an exciting lecture problem. The gaseous equilibrium reaction shown here is established at 500 kelvins. An equilibrium mixture of the three gases has partial pressures at equilibrium of these individual values shown here for each of these substances, respectively. What then is the Kp for this reaction at 500 kelvin? Now, I'm not going to answer this question for you, but based on the information I just got done explaining, I'll let you answer this on your own. With that said, let's return to Kc. As we just got done explaining, for any general reaction with this formula or anything like it, the rate constant in terms of concentration, or Kc, is this when that reaction reaches equilibrium. Now, if we remember the ideal gas law, to which I'll link right here, then we can use individual pressures for A, B, C, and D to calculate N, the number of moles, for each reactant and component at equilibrium. Each n value can then be coupled with our volume to calculate Kc. I'll show you how by introducing you to this problem. If the vessel described in the previous problem that we had two slides ago has a volume of 5 liters, what is Kc at 500 Kelvin? Now, I'm not going to do this here. You're welcome to pause, attempt it on your own. And then afterwards, if you like, you can click the link here to a separate video in which I'll do it on the board. We'll now move on to a different subject. I want you to suppose that we know the concentrations of reactants when a reaction starts, but we don't know their concentrations when it reaches equilibrium. Is there any way that we can calculate them? The answer, of course, is yes. As it turns out, if we know the stoichiometrically balanced equation for the reaction and we have the equilibrium concentration of the products, then we can calculate the concentrations of the reactants at equilibrium. We can then use this info to calculate Kc. To illustrate how this is done, I'm going to show you an example problem on the board. This one. A closed system initially containing this concentration of H2 and this concentration of I2 at 448C is allowed to reach equilibrium. And at equilibrium, the uh, HI concentration is this. Calculate Kc at 448 for the reaction taking place, which is this one right here. How do we do that? I'll show you that right now. OK, so here's how we solve this kind of problem. First, we have to make a table like the one shown here, where we fill in everything we know and we leave blank everything that we're missing. For instance, in this problem, it tells us that the initial concentration of H2 gas is this number. The initial concentration of I2 gas is this number. And the initial concentration, OK, it doesn't tell us the initial concentration of product. But you should understand that at initiation, the, init the concentration of product is 0, because nothing's been produced yet right at the start. It then also tells us that the final equilibrium concentration of the product is this. This kind of table, by the way, is called an ICE table. ICE is an abbreviation for initial, change, and equilibrium. That's hopefully easy to remember. Now that we have this table laid out, we'll go on to step number two, which is in columns where the initial and equilibrium concentrations are both known. 
calculate the difference between them. In this case, that's in this uh, HI or hydroiodic acid column. So the initial concentration is 0. The final concentration is this number. So what's the change? Well, it's obviously this number minus 0. So it's that. Hopefully that ain't too bad. Step 3. Use the stoichiometric coefficients from the balanced equation to calculate the missing change in concentrations right here. I'll now show you how to do this on the board. Now I have to fill in these two blanks right here and right here. How do I go about doing that? What I'll do is I'll use this number right here, the change in concentration for HI, and the stoichiometric coefficients here, here, and here to determine what those numbers are. Assuming that I have produced 1.87 times 10 to the negative third molar equivalents of HI, what would the molar equivalents need to be for each of these substances? I'll write that down here. So 1.87 times 10 to the negative third uh, moles of HI, and I'll go ahead and write moles of HI. Uh, I'll go ahead and write moles of HI in the denominator, and I'm going to start with my moles of H2, moles of H2. Now I just look at the bounce stoichiometric equation. How many moles of HI are there for each mole of H2? I've got one mole of H2 for every two moles of HI. The moles of HI cancel each other out, and that ends up giving me a final answer of 0.935 times 10 to the negative third moles of H2. What that means then is in order to produce 1.87 times 10 to the negative third molar equivalents of HI, I have to sacrifice 0.935 times 10 to the negative third molar equivalents of H2. If you do the stoichiometry for I2, you end up getting also the same answer because it's a one-to-one -one equivalency between these. What sign do I use for this? I'm going to use a negative sign. And the reason is because as this uh, item increases, these have to decrease by these uh, molar corresponding amounts. Hopefully that makes sense. So that is the answer to those two blanks. The change in concentrations for H2 and I2 then are these numbers. Now step four is subtract the stuff in row two from the stuff in row one to fill in the missing places in row three. I'll now show you how to do that on the board. In order to fill in these two blanks, all we need to do is take this number and subtract from it this number. The answer is going to be our final uh, concentration. We then do the same process for this column. We take that number and subtract from it this number. When I do that, I end up getting 0 0.065 times 10 to the negative third for my hydrogen, and I get 1.065 times 10 to the negative third for my iodine. Isn't a nice table wonderful? I've got my initial concentration, my change in concentration, and my concentrations at equilibrium. We then should get these numbers to fill in the blanks. Now that we have all these numbers in our brains, we'll go to step five. In step five, we now put our numbers into the Kc expression and solve for it. Kc then is going to be equal to the equilibrium concentration of Hi squared divided by each of the equilibrium concentrations of the reactants multiplied together. We have numbers now for each of those, which we got from our ice table. Those numbers are these. We throw that into our calculator and get our final answer, which comes to 51. I'm going to leave you then with some beautiful problems. The first says a mixture of this many moles of NO, that many moles of H2, and that many moles of H2 is placed in a 1 liter vessel at 300 kelvins. The following equilibrium is established. At equilibrium, the concentration of NO is this. Calculate the equilibrium concentrations of these species, and then calculate Kc. Now, I'm not going to show you how to do that in this video right here, but I will give you the hint that you have to do it using an ice table, as I just illustrated with the previous example. If you'd like, you can pause the video here and attempt to do it on your own. You can then click the link down here in which I will do it for you on the board. Now this example, nitrosyl bromide, this crazy compound right here, decomposes according to this equation. A sample containing this many moles of nitrosyl bromide is placed in a one liter flask containing zero or no nitrogen monoxide and bromine. At equilibrium, the flask contains this many moles of nitrosyl bromide. How many moles of NO and Br2 respectively are in the flask at equilibrium? Like the previous example, I'm not going to show you the answer right here, but I will give you the hint that it requires doing an ice table just as we did with the example earlier. 
you're welcome to pause the video here, attempt it on your own, and then if you wish, click the link down here in which I will show you how to do it on the board. And now I'll conclude with this example. A one liter flask is filled with one mole of H2 and two moles of I2 at 448C. The value of the equilibrium constant expression Kc for this reaction is that number. What are the equilibrium concentrations of H2, I2, and HI in moles per liter? Now this is an interesting one because in this problem, we actually have the value of Kc. We also have the initial concentrations of H2 and I2. What we lack are the equilibrium concentrations of H2, I2, and HI. And that is what we're asked to do. Now I'm not going to solve this problem for you at all. Even on the board, I will make you do it on your own. However, I will give you the hint that you have to use an ice table to do it. That takes us to the end of this lecture. Please stay tuned for the next one, in which I'll continue teaching you more about chemical equilibrium. Until then, have an enjoyable rest of your day.